go live. So good to see you guys. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in this big planet of ours that gets smaller every day or bigger, whichever way you look at it. And we've got, uh, you guys are tuning in from all over the place. There's Paul in uh, Toronto and Monique is in Canada, another Canadian, eh? Um, and there's uh back me where i don't know where you are but anyway this is awesome to see you guys from all over the world we got an exciting guest today who probably needs no introduction but i'm going to give him one but let's get down to a couple other points before i introduce our guest i'll introduce myself if you don't know who i am yet Mark Silver. I'm an author, educator, and various other things I do here, like surfing and hiking and whatnot, in Carmel, California. Good to have you guys with us. Our show is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo. They've got some specials here. Now, you guys know you got to make prints. If you haven't heard me say that yet, here it is. You got to print your stuff. And there's a lot of ways you can put things in print. Bay Photo will help you. What have they got? 20% off on gallery boards. Those are cool. See, they have a little stand there and you can make, you know, make your prints small, big, whatever. 20% off. And then there's all these cool photo gifts you can make. Ornaments, you can make cards, you can make, what do they got? A face mask. Those are 10% off. And as always, you're going to get 25% off on your first order. So here's the deal, you guys. Do yourself a favor. Help me help you. Help Bay Photo help you and help yourself. <laughs> That's a lot of helping. Get in there and order something today, okay? All right. Now to our guest, Dan the Man. Here he is once again. The one and only, the evangelist for Blurb, the documentary photographer, the guy who makes us laugh and jump and scream and just get excited about photography dan so good to have you back with yep us. and as you learned earlier i am a tech savant as he well He's, so wait, folks, anything gotta, to do with technology I gotta just bring you up to date in the five or so weeks that we haven't had dan on the show he was abducted by aliens and is turned into a geek i i you know i don't know what happened exactly but now he's a tech savant he is Got more stuff. Yeah, look at new mouses. This is what happens. You leave the guy alone. Black Friday hits. He goes wild and buys a bunch of tech. You know what? But yeah, the the, the depths of my hypocrisy <clears throat> are considerable. So uh, no, point. I didn't. Some most most of this was sent to me from. Thankfully, I work for Blurb, and uh, they've replaced my old laptop with a newer laptop and uh yeah it's been good so it's pretty cool winter has arrived here in new mexico snow low temps and uh that means i'm inside doing a lot more uh screen time so all these tools are are good but i was excited about today's topic it's uh yeah. it's it's something that reminds me of the first day that i was in the dark room which had to be like 19 let me think about this. It had to be around 87 or 88. Oh yeah. And I ruined, I ruined the first roll of film I ever processed. I, you know, I had the stainless steel reel and I rolled the film on the reel in the dark and yeah. the whole class was in there and the instructor was telling us how to do this in the dark. And I didn't know the film was supposed to fill the whole reel. And so I rolled it on top of itself. And so oh, when I processed it and then unraveled it, the emulsion came off in my hands that's and I was like, sight. But I remember, you know what I remember thinking at that moment? I don't remember thinking, I'm bummed I ruined this roll of film. I remember thinking that I didn't want to shoot individual images. I wanted to shoot stories. Wow. And I don't know why that came into my head at that what time. I should have been concerned about topic. the film. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah, see, Mark, I'm a pro. You are. You just, <laughs> um, you just brought us right back. And, then, you know, Dan, we've been talking, I've been talking a lot about... <laughs> 
why we need individual projects. In fact, everybody in AYP Plus in my master class has an assignment to come up with their project over the next 13 weeks. So this is really good timing. So speak to us. Yeah, so pro projects are an interesting thing. They've been popping up a lot on my YouTube channel as well. A lot of questions about projects. And some of the questions are very much in line with what you'd expect. And others are got kind of bewildering to me, not in a bad way, just in a, in a strange way about how people think about projects or the stresses that they put on themselves for doing pro or wanting to do a project. Um, questions about lack of motivation, lack of focus. Those are a little bit bewildering to me. I've never suffered from those um, particular illnesses um, and that's just luck, I guess, yeah. but we can talk about that. So I, ha I have three little subcategories that I wanna talk about All just right. quickly with some bullets, get to the questions it. and yeah. some of the things that you guys brought up uh, from the class. So why are projects important? And I think the first thing that has to be said about doing projects and Mark and Jared and I just touched on this briefly before we went live, which is a long-term photographic project, whether in your, your case, Mark, with your class of 13 weeks, or in my case right now, the, pro the current project that I have going, I have two current projects. One I've been working on for six years and one I've been working on for two years whether it's 13 weeks or six years or whatever, the, doing a long-term project is the antithesis of our culture. It's the antithesis of how our society operates. Yeah. And it's frankly an antithesis of the professional photography industry, the modern photography industry, which is very much about right now and about sharing incessantly and just the more, 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 more. And when you do projects, you do not under any circumstances want to share them that way. And so to do a project means that you're sort of isolating yourself, at least in a part of your life for an extended period of time. And for, if, for people who spend a lot of time online or are constantly looking for that sort of dopamine hit, it can be very frustrating and very hard because, and feel counterintuitive yeah. because you're like, everyone's telling me to put everything online all the time. And I'm telling you not to do that. And I'm telling you, and this is where it gets really interesting because the fun part, once you dive into a story and you start to get lost in that story and when a story gets good, you can't think about anything else or do anything else. And the idea of sharing every single thing that you're doing along the way disappears because the engagement with the story is so tight and so in depth and it's a wonderful feeling it's not one that i have often these days because i have so many other responsibilities and duties last week i was able to work on this project i thought i was going to have three days i ended up with about a day and a half that's not really enough time to do much of anything yeah. but it was still fun to be out there and when i was out there i wasn't thinking of you or me or anyone else i was just thinking about the project and that's a really fun thing so Let's talk about why they're, these are important. And I have five little bullets here. Bullets here. The first point is that they, they prove that we have the ability to go in depth with our photography, that we're not superficial. Um, the beauty of a project is that you get to know a subject in depth. And you know, there's a lot of folks out there today that know a little bit about a lot, but they don't know a lot about very many things. And so the project is a way for you to, to really showcase your in-depth knowledge. Two, the project forces you into sustained focus. And again, this is the antithesis of our culture and the attention in society. So you've got to stay focused. And if this isn't something that you're used to doing, it can really take some training and some time to understand how to do it. Uh, point number three is it teaches us to build a visual story and not single images. And that's a very different animal because a story of images is going to contain things that are not aesthetically pleasing. So if you've been walking around trying to hit home runs on first pitch fastballs all day long, and all of a sudden some of the pitchers throwing you slow 80 mile an hour curve balls over and over and over again, now you know what it's like to do a photo project. You're not getting the same thing all the time. You have to think about your reader and your viewer understanding the points that you're trying to get across. So that's a really fun way of working, especially if you've never done that before. Um, and let's just skip to the, to the fifth one. The fourth one is a little bit of a repeat of, of the third one. But the fifth point is that doing a story shows that you can produce good work over an extended period of time. 
And what that proves as a photographer is your consistency. So for example, you could go out, you could be an unknown photographer and you could go shoot a photo essay and win the Pulitzer Prize. And there is gonna be a, the photo editor, the next photo editor you run into is gonna look at you and say, I don't care. That could have been a one-off. You could have lucked out. I, how, how do I know you can do this again? And so shooting a body of, of really consistent imagery and my library in there is filled with photographers who are able to do this, consistently produce those events over time. That means that you have your act together, that you know what you're doing as a photographer. All right. What are some of the challenges that you can run into on a project? I have can five. We, before you get can into we, the challenges, can we, yeah. I just want to back up on one thing. So not everybody yep. listening, we've got an international audience, may, may, me, even me, I want to ask about the analogy with baseball. So you're okay, let's back that up. So the challenge comes in, where do where are the curveballs? Like, what are some of the curveballs that you run into in one of these projects? Curveball, my curveballs? Me, me, <laughs> so for you guys who aren't up to American baseball, that's, you know, the pitcher throws it, but he puts a spin on it. And so it kind of curves in. It's not coming straight at you. And you can easily swing and miss. So what are the things you swing and miss at in a, in a project? So I have five main issues that pop up. Okay. Wow, yeah. Not all, none of these have anything to do with cameras or technique or any of that stuff because I've been doing that long enough to where I don't have to think about that anymore. Um, number one is time. Yeah. These take, and, and again, it's the antithesis of culture is to go spend, you know, the, the, I just made my sixth trip to this location to work on one of my existing projects. And that's over a two year time frame. And so time, I work full time for blurb. It's crazy. You know, I had to take vacation to go do the project. It wasn't like Blurb said, oh, you know, this is a great idea. You should go do that. They were like, well, if you're going to go, you have to take vacation days. So I took three vacation days to go out there to try to do this. And time is a nightmare for me because I never have remotely enough. That's why I'll probably never be able to do a long-term project at the level that I want because I just simply don't have the time to do it anymore. I haven't for the last 11 years. Yeah. Um, number two is resources. This is something that a lot of people are running into. And these are, these are problems that I have that I think a lot of you are going to have the same, you're going to run into the same bumpers that I am. Yeah. And that's resources. You know, it took, again, I had to take three days of vacation. Most of the people that are watching this call right now have jobs. And so you have those responsibilities. You have limited finances. You have limited time. Again, that's the tricky part. Number three is access. Gaining access to locations to do this kind of work is getting more and more difficult. It's not getting easier. It's getting more difficult. So get proving your access is, is very hard depending on your project. Number four, which I don't have a problem with, but a lot of people do, is lack of focus. And that's a, that's a training of your mind and your brain to, uh, to really eliminate distraction. And number five, this has popped up. Again, I don't have this problem per se, uh, but a lot of other people do. And it's a bit odd to me, but I under, still understand it, is uh, insecurity. They feel like they're afraid to go into the world and say that I'm going to work on a project. And someone said something interesting to me recently, which was they took a class, they signed up for a class. And when they signed up for the class, it gave them reason when they were in the field and someone said, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing here? They said, oh, I'm taking this class and I'm working on a project. And it gave them the confidence to yeah. actually go and do the project. And without having that class behind them as sort of a legitimizing, legitimizing factor, they were like, I'm too insecure to do this kind of work. So those are some things um, that, that are point, challenges I think. are. Yeah. Dan, you know, yeah. that last point I've always found when I, when I decide I'm going to do a project, I'm writing a book and then I announce it to people, I get way more comp cooperation because they realize it's not just some, some idle kind of bunch of photographs or writing that I'm going to be doing. They're participating in actually, building that story and I find it it actually opens doors that I wouldn't have had open to me before. So it actually you can turn that whole insecurity around and act, just like you said, if you're part of a class, but you can do this even on your own. 
to say, I am doing a project on my own local neighborhood during COVID, let's say, and this is what I'm going to be documenting. And I'd like to take, you know, your photograph. So it, it can actually turn a weakness into a strength. Yeah. I think to projects to hear the word no. And it's. I think we're uh, losing you no. there, Dan. Dan, we've got a little, little bit. bit of a, am I a, yeah, it's just frozen getting a, or am I still going? It's, you, uh, you're kind of going. You're coming back a bit more. Yeah, your your quality went out there for a bit, but I think you're coming back. We're losing your signal a little bit. Uh, maybe I don't know if you have other Wi-Fi stuff that you could turn off. Maybe get us strengthen that signal a little bit. John, let me uh, let me go here. Uh, see, nothing is the really of live fun, performance. So yeah, this is what happens with live stuff, you guys. Somebody, I don't know if you want to check that out. I can chatter for a minute while you look around and see if there's any other Wi-Fi connections you can eliminate and maybe open up that uh, stream a little bit. Yeah, there's nothing. Um, no, I haven't no. changed anything. Yeah. And okay. so the little screen at the bottom, I look fine. We're hearing you. As, yeah, that'll be your camera and what you see from yourself. So it would yeah. look good for you. We're, we're hearing you, but we're not we're not getting too much. Money. Also, uh, some more people are saying that you're still pretty quiet, Mark. So you may want to just adjust right. the gain on your microphone. Okay, I'll turn it up some more, you guys. You want to? So how's that? We're, I'm. I've got it. Well, that's that's sounding a little bit better on my end. Got it. So hopefully up that helps you. Pretty high. So okay, um, Dan, if you. Do you think there's other uh, Wi-Fi stuff being utilized in your house that maybe you could get shut down? We could talk. We could actually talk about some of these points on the side here for a second if you want to go check that out. So let's let's do that. Okay. So yeah, Jared, I think we lost them. <laughs> we lost them. We might have to reconnect there in a minute. But meanwhile, we've got a whole bunch of questions I see rolling in here. Oh, lots of questions. So maybe we could just take up some of those and I'll try to, I'll field them until we get our friend Dan the man back. Yeah, here's one that you could probably help. And then if Dan knows anybody else too, um, Chris is asking uh, for some of the best examples of photographers who excel at sequencing and how it propels storytelling. Yeah. So do you have any off the top of your head that you can think of that are like really good photographers at sequencing? Yeah, uh, I'm going to I'm going to let Dan do that. I mean, there's a, so many different ones and it's in different genre. I mean, I was thinking about it today, even Ansel Adams. So one of the things that happened with him, he, you know, he became a, a huge uh, influencer in terms of uh, preserving our our national parks, what became national parks. And one of the projects that he got was for the Bank of America to go around in their various different branches and post beautiful photographs of national parks and scenery that, and places that weren't yet national parks. And he helped popularize the idea of preservation. And, you know, that was a almost like a lifetime project of his. So you can you can look at these projects like, you know, short term, 13 weeks or whatever, a year, two years. And then some photographers go into long term projects. Another one is is uh, Richard Avedon, the amazing series of portraits he's taken that he took over the you know various time periods. And one of them was in the West where he basically traveled with um, a white backdrop. I think he used gray too sometimes, but mostly white. Oh, there's Dan coming back. Let me just answer that call. There he is. Okay, I see motion. This is good. I'm going to I'm going to bring you back on, Dan. I think we're good. Let's hear something. Yeah, that's so I don't I think maybe the whole cell network went down here. It could be. But I was just, we had a question about some of the projects that, you know, photographers that are known for their sequencing. And I, I just was talking about Ansel Adams over basically his whole lifetime of 
championing, you know, preservation of our wilderness. And Richard Avedon being a second example of, you know, his uh, in the, you know, his project going through the West and getting that series of portraits. Those are just two off the top of my head. I know, I'm sure you've got a lot of other favorites of, you know, long-term project example photographers. I mean, Salgado, yeah, Salgado. Jill Perez, Maggie Stieber. Um, BuzzFeed yesterday ran a uh, story about Hannah Kozak in LA with her new book, which is called uh, He Threw the Last Punch Too Hard, which is about domestic violence. And wow. that's that book's getting a ton of publicity. She's actually going to be in our second issue of AG23, the zine uh, that's being designed right now. I mean, pretty much every photographer I know is a long-term storyteller that those are the photographers that I'm interested in. I don't typically follow like, you know, still still life photographers or, you know, but, but here's the thing where I see, a, I'll, I'll just use one, one case study and that's street photography. Um, street photography is a peculiar modern phenomenon to me, right? It's probably in the, in the amateur world of photography, street photography is probably the single hottest genre going. True. Everybody's talking about street photography. Yeah. Very few people in the professional industry are talking about street photography. However, there's a huge difference between saying I'm a street photographer and putting that work out and saying, look at my street photography and you focus on the actual techniques and the cameras and all that junk that doesn't matter, the people who do street photography really well are the ones who are actually telling a story and they happen to be using street photography to tell it. Right. Those, that's the difference between an interesting story and project and a photographer that knows what they're doing and an amateur photographer who, who says, I shoot street and look, I used a Fuji X100 and I did this and that and look yeah. at my pictures. And most of the time they look like a group of random, confusing street photographs, right? There's a million of those people working right now and online. And again, there's nothing wrong with that kind of photography, but I got a, I got a book. I didn't get a physical copy. I got a, a, a short film of someone flipping through a book that sent this to me from South America or Central America a couple of weeks ago. And the person said, look, I'm not a photographer and I'm not a designer, but I did this book and this is what my project is. And this is what my story is. And it's about a major city in Central America. And the guy happened, a big percentage of the book happens to be street photography from this city, a one particular neighborhood in the city that he's using as a representation for the whole project. And the street photography is really good. It's like, the I mean, it's rare for me to find street photography that I look at and go, this is really good. This was really good. And the first thing the person said to me was, I'm not a photographer and I'm not a designer. And his photographs were outstanding and his book design was outstanding, but he has a secondary career. He has a, he has a primary career that he operates in on a daily basis. That's what doing projects is about yeah. it's about the story itself and there's a you know story is probably one of the most overused words in in the modern creative space right now it's especially in the marketing arena everybody's talking about telling stories and this and that yeah and a story to me when someone says well what's a story or how do i tell a story you know how when you're at a party and let's say that you're at eight you're schmoozing at a cocktail party in the Hollywood Hills, right? You're, you're kind of a B, B level celebrity and you're at this party and you're hanging out and you're trying to act cool and you got a drink in your hand and you're in the con you're talking to somebody you don't know. And the person is telling you something and halfway through what they're telling you, it makes you think of something and you start to queue up your response when this person <laughs> stops talking right now you're just waiting for them to stop talking right because you have you have your next thought locked and loaded yeah that's a story that's all it is it's that you've got something on your mind and you want to tell someone else that's right. that's all it is yeah. and and where i get my story ideas literature music art I try to reduce a big concept down to a very small atomized idea. 
an atomized either region or person that's representative of the much bigger story. And um, that's how it works. And so I've noticed in the chat that there are a multitude of great questions. Yeah, I want to get into those, but let's let's drill down into this because this is super important. Like, OK, you know, because I have assigned the guys in the AYP plus they're going to come up with a with a project and some of them don't know how to start on that. So you, you I, I'm with you on the inspiration stage of music, you know, the Beatles. To me, okay, so maybe this dates me, but the thing about the Beatles was they were constantly looking for uh, not just creating an album with a bunch of songs on it. I mean, that's what they were known for is they had a whole story going on in inside the, you know, each one of those songs fit into that story. Sgt. Pepper's is the most classic one. And they, they made up this whole story about Sgt. Pepper's and then they put the songs together so they had a beginning, middle, and end. And I think that was something really new. The Beach Boys were also doing that. So they got it, they kind of inspired each other. But we can get inspired by music and, as you said, literature. But let's just say, okay, here I am, Dan. I, I got to come up. Mark has given me this assignment. I got to come up with a project. I don't have a friggin' clue. Where do I start? What do I do? Ah! Get out my notebook, just start writing out ideas. I mean, what, what's a good way to approach that? Yeah, I'm not opposed to the notebook idea. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not opposed to the idea of asking yourself what you care about, what you find interesting. I mean, I've had to do projects that I don't care about when I get assignments. Yeah. And they send you to go do something or you're photographing someone or something that you're just not into. And that's that's OK. That's one challenge. But if I was going to take a 13 week class and spend 13 weeks of my life on something, it would be something that I actually cared about. Absolutely. Um, two, two, I would want something with complete and total access. Three, I would want something that is very close to where I live so that I do not have to travel great distances. Um, and if that means re understanding or learning how to see something that I've taken for granted for my whole life, let's say that I live next to the Mississippi river. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, I've seen the Mississippi my whole life. But maybe I need to to, you know, um, I need to look at it in a different way. I could go look at books on the Mississippi, Alex Soth's book on the Mississippi, for example, Sleeping by the Mississippi, you know, which, by the way, is not my favorite Alex Soth book. I think his Niagara Falls book is my favorite. But that's, you know, you, you I that's where I get inspiration. I This morning I found I learned about a Norwegian poet who wrote a, he grew up in a small village in Norway. And he wrote a book of poetry about the end of the Cold War based on being a child working in the fields in Norway. And I, when I found out about him, I was like, oh, my God, I'm, as soon as I'm off this YouTube live, I'm going to find that book. That's fascinating to me. Um, I also just found out about a book written by a woman in the early 1900s about the very specific location that I have been working on my photo project for the last two years. I had no idea that this woman existed. I had no idea this book existed. And it is literally about the exact place that I'm standing when I'm doing these photographs. And so I would just look for something I love, something that's close, and something I have access to. That is bingo, right on. You guys, that's, <laughs> there you go. And it's got to be propelled by that passion, because if you don't have the passion it ain't going to happen. You're going to run into the first brick wall and not pull yourself off of it and get yourself going again. That's yeah, it's, you know, life's too short. There's a lot of challenging things about our lives. And so you want your photography project to be rewarding, you know, f physically and psychologically rewarding for you. And so if you have a choice, just, you know, take your time and uh, and find something, you know, just ask yourself, what do I love? What's close? Uh, and what have I had? What have I not done? You know, the idea is if someone signs up for your class, Mark, and, and they're, you know, they have a certain style of project they've done 20 times and they know they can do it and they put it online and people tell them it's good. Well, what's the point of doing that again? You know, the idea of a class is an, or a workshop is not to walk away with a new portfolio. The, it's the idea is to learn. 
and to take chances and to do things that you haven't done before because then your 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 colleagues in the class and your instructor can say hey you tried this and it worked and you tried this and it didn't work so that's the beauty the beauty of a class or a workshop is that you have permission to fail and that you can really try some new things right on do you guys hear that that's why you should be in the AYP plus class in fact Jared will yeah the plus and we still have it on Cyber Week special. Jared, why don't you put that link in? So one thing about inspiration, this is a, this is a cool story. We sh you can get it from anywhere. You can get it from anywhere. A, a classic story is Ron Howard when he made Cinderella Man about the boxer. I forget the name you, you can remember. Yeah. Okay. His inspiration, I saw this because I took his master class. His inspiration came from a Popeye cartoon of Popeye fighting Bruto, and he actually built the film around that. Isn't that incredible? Now, you could think, whoa, that's so Mickey Mouse. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to use that as my inspiration. But he chose it because that Popeye cartoon was done at the same time as this boxing was going on. So he knew that, that it was authentic to that era. And he basically used it as his storyboard for his filming. So the point is, you guys, you can get inspiration from anywhere. Picasso talks about this. You get inspiration from the most, whatever, a cobweb or a dust mode or something, you know, something. I have this series of photographs. David Douglas Duncan, talk about a, a, a photographer that you should look into in terms of his commitment to a story. He's, he captured Picasso over a 25 year period. He was primarily known as a war photographer, but after the war, he got onto this project of photographing Picasso and photographed him over 25 years. That was his project. And he produced, I don't know, three or four different books about Picasso and very intimate. One of them being Picasso's eating, you know, he's sitting at the table with his wife and they're, they're eating, um, soul fish and you know he takes the the spine of the fish out and holds it up and all of a sudden you kind of see this little aha right he finishes his meal goes into his pottery studio makes a clay representation of that soul takes the you know the fish spine presses it in he makes two of these puts it on a plate splashes on some color puts it in the kiln, and he basically makes a clay model of his meal. Now, the rest of us are thinking, how can I throw this fish thing out so it doesn't smell up my whole house? And Picasso's turning it into an inspiration. Boom, right? So yeah, you can I just find that inspiration, no matter what it is, where it is, it's, it's going to be your inspiration, not somebody else's, and you should run with it. So I was reading yesterday that Henry David Thoreau wrote a poem, wrote, wrote something about nonviolent protest over the Mexican-American War, and he went to jail for it. Wow. And Gandhi found out about it. And Gandhi looked at, so Henry David Thoreau was the first nonviolent protest, first person to go to jail for nonviolent protest. I didn't know. Gandhi found out about Thoreau, read Thoreau, and said, I love this concept of nonviolent protest. I want to nationalize this. And that's what he used as the foundation for Indian independence. And then Martin Luther King saw what Gandhi did and said, I want to try the same thing for, for the benefit of African Americans. And I was like, and I had never put those three people together before. And and seeing the consistent thread of influence and inspiration from, you know, different decades and generations and causes and all this stuff but it's that theme of influence that runs through here that's fascinating so that is interesting that's why i think i think literature and music and art and you know i i typically do not get story ideas from the photography world for whatever reason yeah um you, and yeah. it's probably because you don't ever want to find yourself saying i'm going to go copy this person yeah. you know so and so did an essay and I loved it. And I'm going to go do something that looks like that. That's not a good idea. And so I think, you know, what we're looking for with projects and stories from individual people is a story from you personally. That's super important. Absolutely. 
Well, Dan, have you covered your main points or should we just jump into the questions? Yeah. Because we've got a lot of yeah, really questions. spot on questions. So Jared, you want to, you want to read off a few of these? Yeah, we got lots of good ones. Make sure you're throwing them in. It's not too late. So yeah. throw your questions in. Uh, Suzanne has a good question. How do you juggle more than one project at a time? And then later said, I had a problem with how to focus on a specific project, just started working with a really wonderful mentor that is helping me understand better how to think and to move through a project. Well, first off, hi, Suzanne. We, If you're the same Suzanne, I think we've been emailing or at least we've been commenting on YouTube, but um, ju juggling multiple projects, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to strategize about that. The, I don't really strategize about it because I don't have any other option. You know, the, so the, the two stories I was working on, um, one is here in New Mexico and I've been working on it on and off for many, many years. And March 21st of this year was the, was the last date that I was supposed to be working on that project. And that was about 10 days after the initial lockdown here in New Mexico. And so it made, it was very apparent immediately that I was not going to be able to work on that project safely, not for myself or the people that I was photographing and vice versa. We just couldn't get together and we still can't. So that's a project that's on this, on the back burner. So the project that I've started doing now is a conceptual piece that doesn't have anything to do with people, which is a total novelty for me because all of my projects are long-term and they're based on people and I can't do that now. So one, I've chosen a subject matter that doesn't have physical human beings in it. And two, I've decided to do a conceptual story, which I've never done before. So I'm challenging myself in different ways. And I'm not fooling myself into thinking that what I'm making is going to be good enough to really matter, right? I mean, I'm not, it's not, but it's a lot of fun and it's what I want to do with my free time. So the beauty of doing these things, especially if you're not doing them for someone else, is that there is no right and wrong. Yeah. It's only what you feel. So I realized after reading this morning um, about some poets, I don't know anything about poetry. Um, my original thought for the written part of my project was a movie script, a three person movie script. But that's about 90 to 110 pages of copy, right? Yeah. That's a lot to bite off, especially because I've never written a movie script before. And this morning when I was reading about these poets, I was like, that's more approachable to me and actually might make the story more interesting. So I'm adapting sort of in real time because it ultimately, and I don't mean this to be flippant, it doesn't matter. It's just my little mind game that I'm playing out in the field, right? I could, even if I do the best job I possibly can and I put it out into the world, no one's going to care. It's just not going to, you know, it's never going to hit that level of importance where I'm going to be like, oh, I changed the world with my, with my story. So I would just practice and go and do what feels right for you at that particular moment. And you may, you may start with two projects and think this is the better project and then I'll realize that suddenly the other one better, uh, and you shift over. I think I'm losing you guys yeah. again. You're kind of coming back though. You know, I'm going to take this opportunity. So, yeah, here, here's what I would say, too, is get one project focused on. You know, if you get too many things going, that's going to that's one of those barriers. You know, you got to be focused. Let's get that one project rolling. Maybe at the end of that project, you start thinking up your next one. Now, I'm a guy who I juggle a lot of projects, but it's not always the best thing. You know, I have a movie script that's sitting there partially done and it's, you know, I'm going to get to it. And I know I have the outline for it. I have the treatment and everything, but it's just sitting there. Nothing is happening to it. It will get picked up when I when I come around. It will. But I would say a better approach. What you were saying, Dan, is get focused on that one. Take that take that one home and get her done. Now there's a question here that really kind of segues into what, and I just want to, I want to bring it up right now because you were kind of going in this direction. I'm going to add it to the broadcast. Look at that cool feature. 
Um, you can see that, right, Dan? So there's our question. If there's a scene that is really beneficial to your story you're telling about, but only occurs in terrible light, do you include it? Which is more important, art of photography or a story? That's a great question. It is a um, question. If it's critical to the understanding of the story, then you've got to run it. You know, I mean, look, there's plenty of historical images over time. Look at the look at Vietnam War. Some of these great storytellers, Larry Burroughs or Henri Huey, or these guys that were photographing the war, Nick Oot, not all of their work is, you know, Eddie Adams, not all of that work, Catherine Lois. When Catherine Lois was was captured by the NBA and was basically was able to convince her captives to let her photograph them. And that was the first time that anybody had been able to photograph the NBA, the Viet Cong. And that ran on the cover of Life magazine. Those were not images made in great light. Those were images made and they ran on the fact of the power of the subject matter. Yeah. And that that work won her the like the medal, medal of excellence, um, among other prizes as well. And, you know, that was I, I can assure you that the light was probably the last thing on her mind when she was making those photos. She was probably one happy to be alive to, you know, unbelievable access. And if Catherine Lois was a unique woman, for sure. And one of the feistiest, you know, people you're ever going to meet, which is why she was such a great photographer. And so. I think in your portfolio, you may want to eliminate these images that are in bad light. But if you're telling a story, I would certainly put them in the hopper. If they're if they're providing information that's critical to the story, then you run it. That's my opinion. Right on. Yeah, uh, Robert Kappa is a, an excellent example when he photographed D-Day. And I think almost every one of those is blurry. So you could say, whoa, those were blurry images. Yeah, they were blurry. He was in the middle of a friggin' operation that was like bullets flying and whatnot. But that is what you're capturing. You're that's the truth of the matter. And some of those some of those are incredibly blurred out. But it gives you it, if anything, it adds to the, the tension of the story, right? Because that's the and if you look at going. if you look at the last image that he made before he died, he stepped on a landmine in Indochina. He was with oh. the French. Uh, in Vietnam, and he shot a color image, which looks like it was made with a 35 millimeter lens in a in sort of a rice paddy of these French soldiers on patrol. And it's the light's not great in that photo. It's more of a high noon, you know, in the tropics, um, sometimes if, with the weather patterns, you can get amazing light in the middle of the day. Um, but look at look at the work of Alex Webb. Yeah. You know, the Magnum photographer, Alex Webb, Hot Light, Half Made Worlds, you know, his book from Haiti. He's one of the only photographers I've ever seen that made a career of shooting in bad light. And he figured out how to do it. And his work is beautiful. And he's, you know, his, the, literally the title of the book is, is Hot Light, Half Made Worlds. And so, you know, there are ways of doing it. But, um, you know, if, if I have a choice as to when I'm going to work, I'm going to work when the light is optimal for the kind of work that I'm after. And then I take the times of day where the light is bad and I'm doing research or I'm traveling or I'm making connections or making phone calls or I'm writing. I'm trying to catch up in the written form as to what happened during the last shoot when the light was good or what I think is going to happen in the next shoot when the light is good. And so it's um, the, 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 the part that you want to avoid is, is having a chance to work in good light and not doing it and, yeah. you know, being kind of lazy and saying, oh, I'll just show up wherever and, you know, I'll try to fix this in post-production or something. Here's the, here's one of the, one of those images of Robert Capra from the D-Day landing. And you can see, you know, he's in the and, midst of this action here. And the other thing too, is the, the backstory of the Kappa work from D-Day. Um, and to Mark's point, I mean, you're talking about one of the most intense military engagements in history, and you have the nerve to make photographs during that. But apparently what happened, and I don't know if this is a, true or not, but the story is that he shipped the film to life and there was a faulty film dryer and the technician put it into the film dryer and it actually started to melt the emulsion, which is why those pictures look the way they do. And apparently life was gonna fire the technician and Kappa said, no, you know, it's not his fault. Don't don't fire him. And those pictures, I think in some ways, 
they have even heightened the, the motion and the blurriness of those images is actually heightens the power of what they actually are. Amazing. But, you know, to photograph, to think about being at D-Day or any military engagement like that, and then having the guts to like still be able to operate and frame things and, you know, reload your film and make sure your lens isn't wet and, you know, all this stuff. It's just mind blowing what these people were able to do. Yeah. Let's take another question. And Jared, you see that cool feature. We can actually put those on the screen. So if you kind of give me yeah, give me a heads up and I'll stick it on the screen. Um, let's take uh, this one. Uh, it's the second comment uh, from Stellos. Have you ever felt that there is just so much repetitiveness in photography, the same kind of photos over and over again? Uh, I think that's something we've kind of touched on a little bit before, but I'd like to hear you uh, expand on that. The short answer is no, because I don't look at work online. I look at books. And when a book, a photo book goes to print, there has been so much work involved in putting that together. The editing, the sequence, working with the, the publisher or self-publishing and doing all that and with the editing and sequencing and the time involved, um, it's typically if I if I take my time to look at a book, it's not repetitive. Um, and I have I don't know how many books on similar subjects. You know, I have I love books. Vietnam War was very important to me becoming a photographer. So I have a lot of books about that. I have a lot of books from the 90s that are black and white, long term, 35 millimeter books about Russia, about Uganda, about Rwanda about um, Iran, all these places, even though it's black and white 35 millimeter, they are not repetitive at all. What's repetitive tends to be online photography because online photography in many ways is not about photography, it's about popularity. And when something becomes popular, it's common now to just copy it so that you can ride the coattails of someone else to become popular. And that's why I don't look at Instagram. I'm not on Instagram. I don't look at Facebook. I don't look at work online because there's often just not very much thought put into it other than the sense of some people are masterful at becoming popular. And if, if that's a goal of you as you have as a photographer, and that's a legitimate goal, if you want to be popular, then, you know, learning how to do that is, a, is a skill, but it's just not interesting to me. Um, you know, maybe I'm, I'm jaded in the sense that I've looked at a lot of photography in my life, but I'm looking for a certain quality that I know is hard to find. You know, great photography, actual great photography is very rare. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to get it done. And so there's just not that much of it being assigned and being created. It, there's never been that much. But um, today, I don't think there's any more great photography being done than there was 20 years ago or 50 years ago. There's a lot of photography that's getting attention. That's not necessarily good. Um, and I see that all the time. I see some of the best photography outlets in the world showcasing work that's just not very good. It, but it's popular and the artist brings an audience and that's really what people are after. So, yeah. you know, lim limit your on online photography viewing and look at books because the book is a, is a hurdle that most people can't get over. Yeah. Let's pick up this one. This is from Enda. So the question here is how many photos does a project series typically have? Is there a minimum? And, you know, we're talking, about, we're talking about the, you know, the challenges of getting started, but also you got to know when you've finished your project, right? Otherwise, you just keep this thing going on forever. That's actually another question, too. Somebody was asking, how do you end a project? Yeah, well. This so is you can oh, kind of do both of them together. Let's take Enda's question first. Yeah. And um, Enda, the answer is there is no minimum. That's right. I think, I think, and I'm, I am going to do this at some point if I ever get time. I'm going to do an entire book about one photograph. And there's a lot of ways of doing that. If you just stop and think to yourself, okay, I've got one photograph and I'm going to do an entire book on one photograph. How would I do that? There's a lot of ways. And I think that's completely legitimate. And I know because one of the best photo book publishers in the world does one book books, one photograph books. 
And so the, this is not something that's completely original here, but I think, uh, you know, you can do a book with one image. Um, the question about how to end a project, that's pretty interesting. And that that's tough because you can go down the rabbit hole during a project and not stop and not, you know, end. I, I'll give you a perfect example. A movie that I absolutely love is called Wonder Boys oh, yeah. with uh, Michael Douglas and Robert Downey Jr. and Tobey Maguire and um, a whole host of other people. And it's about a, a college professor who's a writer. Yeah. And he's, he's writing a novel. His first novel did really well, became famous. It's used in literary circles and schools. And he's, he's now on his second book, right? And it's a nightmare and things are unraveling. And at the very end of the film, he makes this admission. He's written a book that's like 1300 pages long. And then someone says, why, why on earth would you do that? And he goes, because I just can't stop. I can't, I can't not do this. And so the, a project can become that. And I think, again, another perfect example is there were people that, you know, via, covering something like the Vietnam War or a really great example where this turned out unbelievably well for the photographer. And I think for the country in general, because of the, the impact that the book had in the story was um, Ron Haviv did a book called Blood and Honey about the war in the Balkans. And he spent 10 years covering the war in the Balkans. Now, that's a that's just think about that like going into that place for 10 years in the middle of this conflict and then coming out with this amazing testament and it's not just a photo book like blood and honey is one of the best comprehensive photo books about conflict you're ever going to find um you know that's a that's a commitment but typically it's to put it to to reduce this to a very simple thing is when you put images out on a table and you make small prints. And when you're building a project, you'll often have, you know, sections or chapters or stories of, or, or sections of a project. And you'll put the prints out on a table and you'll see immediately that you have gaps, that you have, you know, lapses in the coverage where you're like, ooh, I don't have enough images of this. Like, for example, the project I'm doing right now is three parts. There's a written part and two photographic parts. The written part is not started. It's started, but not nearly uh, uh, far enough along. One of the visual photography parts is pretty much complete. And the second photography part isn't far enough. And I can, I know that immediately by putting prints out on a table right. and saying, this is what I have to work with right now. And I know that there's two glaring discrepancies here that I'm just not, I don't have enough. When you put prints out and you say to yourself, I don't see any gaps or holes. That's when you start to say, I think I'm rounding the corner here. I think I'm about to end this. And, you know, that's when maybe you have a mentor or someone that you trust that you can put it in front of and say, am I missing something here? Am I, you know, for example, you're taking Mark's class. Mark's the one that's going to say, yeah. you might want to rethink this or you may, you, you're done. You know, you're ready to move on. This is great. You did a great job. Super important to have somebody help you out on that. And uh, let's take up this question back of me. Ask this question about AYP+. Plus. Is the 13 week project uh, rolling? If you sign up a couple of weeks, you'll be two weeks behind. You'll never be behind. You start your project when you start it. It doesn't really actually matter where the rest of the group is. Your project is going to be 13 weeks. So even though we, we just began, uh, you know, if you start in two weeks, you'll have your 13 week project and it'll be, you'll have a beginning, middle, and end. So bingo. Here's another one uh, from Francis here. Let me print, bring this up on the screen. And here she is. Uh, there you are, Francis. How would you approach a documentary subject which has a compelling human story but little kinetic movement for exciting photos without just doing staged portraits? Francis, um, another great question. Um, one of the things that you saw in photography starting in sort of the 2005-ish region time frame was you started to see portrait series being described as documentary projects. And this, these were all over the place. When I would go to Perry Photo in Paris every winter to go to these exhibitions, and it's the biggest photo show in the world, what was replacing the long-term projects were portrait series. And these were done because they, they don't take much time. 
um, they're far easier to do than um, going out and doing a comprehensive documentary project. And one of the problems with comprehensive long-term projects is what you describe. Not everything makes a beautiful photograph. And so, you know, you're, you're basically asking the audience for a lot. You're asking them for undivided attention for a, a long period of time. And a portrait series is often very easy to read and very easy to consume. It just flip, 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 people, face, 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 maybe with a little copy block underneath of a quote that that person said. And those can be really effective. But it's, it's a balance of understanding that you don't necessarily need a lot of photos to tell a story. So you can do the portraits and you can do some of the aesthetically exciting imagery, and then you're going to have to do some of the imagery that's not that exciting but again it's been it's been done um and you um <clears throat> you know the hard part is again we and i talked about this before time and resources when you're sitting around and let's say that you're in um i'm trying to think of uh well i'll give you an example i did a project once in austin on a pentecostal uh preacher who was living in east austin in the time <clears throat> at the time <clears throat> in an abandoned condemned building that he had turned into an informal sort of underground chapel and he was like the dearest guy in the world he was awesome hmm. and he wasn't supposed to be living in this place and he had about four constituents members of the church total so and he, he had about a 10-foot wooden cross that he would drag through the streets of east austin at night hmm. handing out religious paperwork to and it was east austin at the time is not the hipsterville it is now it was like a war zone and and i was over there doing a project on gangs and i found this guy wandering the streets one night and i said hey can i hang out with you and he said okay and so i spent days and days and days in this church this abandoned uh you know basically it was kind of an illegal setup and he had four constituents total and Four nothing changed nothing changed it was just me in this room with three or four people for days at a time and you're you're kind of slowly going mad because there is no change happening but here's the funny part one of the four day one says to me please do not photograph me please 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 do not and i said no problem Ob obviously if someone says that you do not photograph them yeah but after a couple of weeks, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking, I've shot the inside of this room a thousand times. I can't do it anymore. Like, I'm going to have to end this story or I'm going to break. And all of a sudden, that one person who says, don't photograph me, sits up. And I still remember the photo. I, I, I know, remember everything about this moment. He sat up and he covered his face with his hands. And he told me his life story about how he ended there. Without me saying anything or asking any questions, he said, you know, I was I was a very important, um, you know, artist, basically. And um, I went to a party and someone gave me heroin. And that was it. And, uh, you know, everything unraveled. And, he, and, and so from going from that same room and I'm in there with these people for days and days, everything changed in that moment. Even though the, nothing in the room changed, the entire project flipped on that one photograph and became so much more. So you you just have to be patient and you have to take your time and realize you're gonna win some and you're gonna lose some. Dan, we have so many awesome uh, questions. I wish we had time for a lot more. I am going, you're gonna be in AYP Plus. We were talking about this. For one thing, you're gonna give us a complete tutorial on creating a blurb book, right? which I yep. don't know, might even be more than one class, but we, we want to get into the, how, how do you do it? So I've got this idea in my mind, but now I need to take these images and what I've written and you're, you're going to be our man. So we're definitely going to get you to do that. And I think we can also take this kind of discussion back into AYP plus and maybe just take up nothing but questions, which would be pretty cool. Right. You guys and just answer your questions as long as we have as long as we have Dan yeah the because man. yeah we're going to do some classes on blurb and i think maybe there's a photo class in there too as well but yeah um these are really good questions these are not 
These are not amateur questions. These are, I can tell that the folks out there who are asking these questions, you're motivated and you're driven and you've already done some work and you've done your homework and you've, you know, these are not things that you're hypothetically thinking you may run into. These are problems you're actually having. And that comes from being in the field and making pictures or being in the field and not being happy or successful with what you've done. And that's, that's great. I mean, I could answer these questions all day long. And remember, I'm just one, one person that has a little bit of experience in these, in this world. Um, but I'm just one person. So, you know, what I'm saying, you can modify to be your own and you can take some things from me and leave others. And that's perfectly, perfectly normal. Bingo. Are there any that you saw that you want to pick up in particular? Uh, well, you know, the, pro the problem. Oops. Oops. Oh, well, this is the beauty of a live broadcast. Just like Robert we broke Kappa. Dan, just like Robert Kappa. We, we wore Dan out. I think he needs to recharge. Okay. Well, listen, you guys will, maybe we'll have him back in a second. I'll go ahead and. Oh, talk. uh, he might back. Uh, Dan back. There he is sort of almost back. Maybe it was the glass. No, nope, maybe not. I'm here. Oh yeah. It was the glass. Okay. Now he's shift. back. <laughs> okay. Shifting the glasses seems to make a big difference with your connection, by the way. Just this connection a, sucks. I know. Well, let's let's yeah. go ahead with that thought you have before we lose you entirely. What was the rest of that? Oh, oh um, no, I was just saying that I didn't have Internet now, oh, so okay. I, I can't see the, the uh, chat stream. Oh, I see. OK, well, listen, I think we've really covered a lot of ground. Dan, I want to thank you on behalf of AYP once again for joining us and you know, one more show, and I think you get the red jacket, the red AYP jacket, or the jean jacket, whichever you prefer. So, you know, it's not too late to earn that Lifetime Achievement Award with AYP. I will take that. Okay, we'll get you on that. Well, listen, thank you once again, Dan. Always a pleasure. I'm going to put you in the back in the green room so you can stick around. We have this... Uh, cool little feature that we can move our guests to the green room. Well, listen, you guys, once again, an amazing broadcast, right? So this is really where we're going with AYP and AYP Plus is, is you know, the projects and also the mentorship, because it really is important to have somebody else look at your work and say, yeah, you need to go a little further in this direction or that's it. It's a wrap. Finish it. Wrap it up. Super important. We can't do all this stuff in our own head. You know, that's why I, when I, when I write a book, I really enjoy having an editor or some often more than one, but I usually, I have a main editor that I'm sending my copy to and they read it and they go, Mark, you know, I don't understand this one section here, you know, or I don't know that your reader will. And I go, okay, let me elaborate on it. Or that's done. Don't keep picking it over. You know, you can tinker with things to death. You can just keep tinkering with a photograph or tinkering with something you've written and it's done. You're done. <laughs> Let it go. Anyway, these are excellent questions, you guys. Thank you for participating. Um, if you missed this earlier in the broadcast, uh, you, you should join AYP Plus and we are keeping the... Uh, you know, the cyber special until this week. Okay, you can still sign up. You get one year, one year for $97. That's just, how much do you spend on coffee in a year, right? I mean, how much do you spend on popcorn when we used to go to the movies? If you go to a lot of movies, you can spend $97 pretty fast on popcorn. And that's for a class a week too, for that whole. So that's what, like 52 classes? Ah. So we'd you know, 50 some classes. What am I committing myself to? But anyway, they're going to be a <laughs> lot of fun. And we're going to have guests like Dan and Bob Holmes and some other cool people that you already know. So you guys should take advantage of it. And it also helps support this show. So help me help you. Um, well, listen, it's been a pleasure once again having you guys with us. Jared, have I forgotten anything other than we've got a remind you guys to subscribe, enable the bell. I don't think I did that at the beginning of this broadcast, but 
don't forget. And yes, Jared, what was that? We got a show tomorrow. Be sure to show up for that. Oh, we haven't done a critique show for a while, yeah. and we've got a lot of photos to go through. We're very excited. Okay, yes, you guys, please tune in tomorrow at 10 a.m. And we're going to give away, we're going to give away, right, Jared? A print yep. from Bay Photo. Last time we forgot to announce that person, so we're going to announce the winner tomorrow of the last one. But we're also going to give away a new print tomorrow. You guys should definitely tune in for that. This is your chance to get critiqued. Show up at 10 a.m. Pacific. Tune in. Okay. Uh, and, and just before we go, somebody asked a question. They were asking, is this not staying on YouTube? Just because we're doing the AYP Plus, uh, all the oh, same no. content that we're doing, that's still staying on YouTube. So, yeah, we're not uh, you know, YouTube. our interviews and the shoot support, like those are all staying on YouTube. This is new extra content. The reason so. why we're, we're going in the, in the AYP Plus direction is because of the name itself, Plus. We can do things that we can't do here. And... We can take more time with certain topics and whatnot and develop them. But also we have a community that are all engaged and involved in that. So they're part of the 13-week project. They're getting to know each other. And it's super important to have the support from the community. Photography isn't just about you doing it on your own. You've got to, you got to get it out to the world. And sometimes you need a real safe group to start with to just say, what do you think about this? And whatever feedback you get can really help you define that project. Okay, I think we've covered everything except to say definitely, you know, subscribe if you haven't already done that, enable the bell, I'm gonna say it again, I can't say it too many times, and like, leave your comments, we always respond to those. And I love all your comments here, you guys, that's incredible. Share and Tune in tomorrow, and remember, say it with me, folks, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Capture life. Love you guys. Stay well, stay safe, stay creative, and we'll see you tomorrow.